and welcome to the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers Big Meeting. ASF is a nonprofit organization devoted to maintaining the separation between religion and state, advocating a scientific and humanistic viewpoint, and improving the lives of non-believers. You can learn more about ASF at arfreethinkers.org. And if you will, make sure that your cell phones are on vibrate. There we go. Must have been a tall person here before me. Now for our standard disclaimer. ASF is a diverse organization with members who represent a wide range of opinions. The speakers who present at our big meetings do not necessarily represent the views of ASF or its individual members. Because we are a 501c3 organization, ASF cannot and does not directly support candidates for public office. We advocate for causes such as separation of church and state, scientific literacy, societal progress, and truthful communication. That said, now we have Byrne Bradley who will present our free thought of the day. Please give a warm welcome to Byrne Bradley. Hello, hello. Success is the progressive realization of worthwhile predetermined goals. That was the definition of success done by a company in Waco, Texas called Success Motivation Institute. They sold courses on goal setting and how to be successful. Courses were really expensive. People that took them generally did pretty well after taking them. Maybe it was just to recover all the money they spent. Uh, but I got $100 cash, a $100 bill for being able to recite that at a meeting in Oklahoma City about 25 years ago. I'll never forget that, and I'll never forget that definition of success either. Reason I bring that up is the board of directors here is in the process of some long-term planning. We want to decide what we want this group to be, and we want to know how to work to get there. So what we need you to do is tell us what you want it to be. Get a hold of, of any board member, come to, the, uh, come to the meetings, come to this meeting, come to our uh, Monday night meeting on Zoom, come to Monday's, uh, tomorrow's pint night, any of that. Talk to board members and tell them what you want this to do because this, there's, there's a, a great deal of uh, difference between things. Some people just like coming because they're in a meeting where they can talk about Darwin without someone going, of course, that's a lie. Some like to be in, involved in something where they can really get involved in some kind of action. But that's what we need you to do. Let us know what's going on. And remember, the whole idea of that definition of success is you have decided what you want it to be and you're making progress toward it and that's where we're headed. I have a dream that the double billboard that's by the First United Pentecostal Church will one day have on top a billboard that says, beware of dogma. And underneath that, a billboard that says, are you good without a God? We are, arfreethinkers.org. Thank you. Byrne just gave the free thought of the day, which, uh, you know, as he mentioned, is something that uh, we have lots of volunteer opportunities for people to do. This is your chance to have a voice. This is your chance to uh, let yourself be heard. And if you have an inspiring story, an inspiring quote, an inspiring thought, then uh, feel free to talk to us about becoming the next uh, person to present. Next on our agenda is misinformation moment. And uh, here we're going to sharpen our critical thinking skills a little bit by analyzing a piece of false information circulating online. And today's misinformation moment is uh, something that I found um, on uh, ABC or CBS News recently. It's about um, an issue where pilots in Australia were getting these death threats all of a sudden. And uh, they didn't know why. So, so here's what happened. Uh, Jim, could you go to next slide, please? So there were these uh, floods going on in New South Wales, Australia. It's uh, fall down there, keep in mind. And they were, they're really, really bad flooding. And 
so somebody out there on uh, social media sees an airplane flying around and you know they just jump to the next logical conclusion right those pilots in that airplane are seeding the clouds and causing more rain to fall and they're responsible for these floods so the, uh, the social media post said, you know, a pilot from Handel Aviation in a Cessna 210N Centurion VH-JIL. Notice the false precision there, that, that, that it's so precise. Oh, this person really knows what they're talking about, right? Did a breakfast time cloud seeding run, because that's just what you do at breakfast time, over Lismore South and Bellina today while sightseeing the massive flood below him. So it was cloud seeding, which is a, a concept of you know, dispersing tiny particles over clouds. Uh, the water vapors, in theory, are going to stick to the particles and help it rain when it's a drought situation. And this, uh, this idea of what they were doing was shared by an influencer, a fashion designer there in Australia, and that's how it started going viral, that people were cloud seeding, and that's why we we're having these floods. Next slide, please. And so what happened is, you know, they, they started getting hundreds or over a hundred death threats and they and the aviation company is like what and, and they put out a statement on their website that says you know we're just an we're just an aerial photography company and the reason we're flying right around right now because of floods is because insurance companies have hired us to you know take take stock of how much damage there was but uh, that didn't really stop anybody you know the quote is we had really violent threatening stuff coming through like we have the pilots names we know where you live you're going to pay for this kind of stuff i mean isn't that scary that somebody sees a plane flying around somebody posts something silly it goes viral people get death threats just like that that quickly next slide please and so and trying to think about the motive the underlying reasons why stuff like this happens um, how would you feel if you had lost your home, if your car got flooded? You've got no home, no car, maybe your place of work is even flooded, and all of a sudden your life doesn't make sense anymore, right? <laughs> you don't have anywhere to live, you don't have anywhere to work, you don't have any way to get there, and, you know, people are desperate for information. They want to answer, and so, you know, one of the quotes in the article was that they need a shoulder to cry on and hear their story. They've basically lost everything, and then somebody has to say, here's your answer. And that's what the market for information was looking for at that moment, was here's your answer. Next slide, please. So the standard uh, form that we fill out, or that I fill out when I'm doing a misinformation moment, the villain is this aerial photography company. The motive is undefined in the article, but they, they had a, they, you could probably come up with something about why a person would want it to flood, insurance or whatever. Um, information only knows, known to those smart enough to read it on social media is that the floods were actually caused by airplanes seeding clouds. And uh, one of the quotes in the article to serve as contrary evidence is that cloud seeding is not even all that effective. And people only do it under limited circumstances anyway, so it's not like it was going to cause a flood in the first place. And it compensates for feelings of lacking control over one's life by, if you lost everything in floods, you need a sense of understanding and a way to vent. Why is it important for you to spread this misinformation as a conspiracy theorist? Because those perpetrators must be held accountable. And that is how it keeps going on and on and on. And people who take photographs for a living out of airplanes get blamed for floods. Everybody's like, wow, this world is stupid. <laughs> but that's OK, because um, we're here to immunize ourselves, so to speak, against this sort of thing. So always think before you share, and, and better yet, don't even go into that swamp. All right, so uh, we're going to not have a member story today. Um, that's another opportunity. If you have a, a story of, in your life or someone else's life near you that you would like to share about how, uh, how you came to a place of free thought or how you um, evolved as a person, Something not even having to do with free thought, that's fine. If it's interesting to us, we'll take it. <laughs> so next up, we have our featured presenter, uh, Judson Scanlon, who is going to uh, talk to us about their journey and some of the uh, legislation that has inspired them to take a, take a stand in the world. And so let's everybody give a warm welcome to Judson.
know you've made it until you see yourself crying up on the screen. There's some blue too. <laughs> Take our moment. So what is this? Is this the speaker for the? Yeah, I got you. Got you. I just want to make sure I'm not trying to yell into something that's not picking my voice up. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Judson Scanlon, and for the last 30 years, I have spent my time running around the country, training people to run for office, running campaigns for folks, and helping people change the world they live in. Now, uh, I have found, I live in Arkansas, and I've been living in Arkansas, well, I grew up here. Let's just face it. Let's just talk about reality, right? So my entire journey started at a very, very young age. When I was five years old, I told my mother that I was a boy. And she did what all mothers did in 1968 and said, no, you're not. <laughs> and ended up, in, and you know, that is, that is the uh, path of my life for the next 58 years, was coming to terms, understanding my humanity, and understanding how my humanity interacts with the world and what it has brought us to. So I can sit here and I can say, oh my God, my life has been miserable because I've been a boy this entire time and now uh, obviously I present as a girl. Or what I can do is say, everything that we're experiencing in the world, this enlightenment that's being brought to us whether we like it or not, this idea of what transgender actually is, is not of our choosing and it's not something that we we often seek. It's something that we are. We're becoming more and more in tune with the idea that our gender is different than our sex. We're understanding what that means, and in fact, those younger than us are gonna help us understand what that means while we sit back and just live. So here's what it means to our world today. We live in Arkansas, one of the places that we identify as the most regressive when it comes to thinking. We don't, we don't, ex we don't, how do I say this? We don't exhaust ourselves trying to find the answer to things. We simply accept that the world is the way it is. That is kind of what Arkansas is like. We're bullies or we're not. We're happy or we're not. And it's really hard for us to, en to envision something that's different when we are subjected to the anger and the vitriol that we see day in and day out. So I wanna tell you why we are actually on the cusp of progress and why everything we're seeing today is actually a door opening for us in the future. We have to go through what we're experiencing because we've been going through what we experienced. And I know that's simple, people it's like, well, that's a little touchy-feely. Well, no, we have to go through what we're going through today because we've gone through what we've gone through in the past. We have allowed ourselves to be controlled and defined by other people. In order for us to get beyond that, we have to fight our way through. We have to fight our way back. So in the control, we are told time in and time out that people believe a certain way. And we accept that because that makes sense to us. I was told growing up that I was a girl. And I had to accept that whether I liked it or not because I present as a girl. But in reality, that's me at the age of 14. I'm the one that's farthest. I'm the farthest, as you're looking at it, as on the right, right? Now let me tell you something, that is me comfortable. That is me with my family in a loving environment where I can be and express myself in the way that I feel like I should express myself. And that to me is different than the idea of what I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be wearing pink and crinoline. I've been spending my entire life showing people something different than what they anticipate. And I intend to keep doing that because here's why. Go ahead and go down to the study that was done. So in the past year, this has been called the most anti-gay, anti-LGBTQ year in our existence on legal issues. Over 200 bills have been introduced to define how people would actually interact with people who identify as gay or lesbian. Those laws include gauging what can and cannot be done in the consult with a doctor and a parent, and controlling the lives of children, to extending as far as to saying things in Florida, for instance, that started the role of the Don't Say Gay Bill. In Tennessee, it has become 
hold my beer situation. <laughs> because Tennessee wants to do one step further. We've seen states time and time again take that control one step further. Well, here's what's happened. If you can go down for me. And I, I just want to note these two websites, the Freedom for All Americans and the Equality Federation. Both of those websites have loads of information about perception of, pub, of the public for folks that are LGBTQIA identified. And they have all kinds of information about legislation that's been done all across the country with exhibits of not only positive, but the negative as well. So they're not centering on just the stuff that we've, done, what we've had done to us, but rather things that we're doing to proactively meet, move the needle. So I wanna show you some interesting data that was come about in the last year. This was done in September and October of last year with Lake Research, and it basically talks about the impact of these laws. Now the impact of the laws has shown that 38% of the population would rather see positive legislation that bans discrimination. And you will see that all of the other things that people are in favor of control certain aspects, but they're unique and small aspects of gay and lesbian life, right? And if you continue down this list, you know, whether it's protecting religious freedom. Yeah, we want to protect religious freedom. That's a given, obviously, with all the control that oligarchs and all the religious right that is done. We, yes, there is a, the public likes that. But what the public doesn't like, if you proceed to the next slide. Oh, no, I'm sorry, go back. I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize that was. The last slide, allowing healthcare providers to uh, refuse to provide treatment for procedures and sex changes and allowing for that to refuse to happen has the least, <coughs> has the least, and if you slide over to the, if you slide all the way over, and that's two slides side by side. So if you slide over, yeah, there we go. We'll see that the least, so if you see all of the stuff that's positive, we have support of more than 20% of the population. But if you go down to the very bottom piece, yeah, Banning affirming medical care for transgender youth is the least popular policy piece. 17% of the country sees that as a priority. And we have seen across the board that 100% of the states that want to actually control and, and put controls in place are going to this issue. This tells us one important thing that I think everybody in this room should remember and everybody at home watching should remember. That is their overreach. They have overreached on the issue of affirming care. And what has happened in result of that is that people know more about transgender people in this country. Adults know more about the process, right? We now know that, and maybe, maybe folks in here don't know, but before anyone can transition in life and truly live their authentic self, they have to live as their identity for more than a year before medical transition. That is a regulated standard. It is not something where people, youth included, walk into a room one day and they decide that they are not living as their true authentic self and they want to change. There's a misunderstanding about what this process looks like. This process takes medical intervention, it takes emotional intervention, it takes a coordinated effort between mental health providers, medical providers, and in the case of minor children, the parents. It never happens by itself, and it never happens as a silo. It's not, it's not me waking up in my fifth grade place and going into my parents and saying, I'm a boy, deal with it. That's not what happens. This is a painful process that we make more painful by imposing our ideas on other people. And so the process actually, the process actually can be alleviated very quickly. And we can actually use this period in time to make vast changes in our communities without even realizing it. Here's how. We know from messaging on this issue that when we talk about a place of values, 
not a place of Christianity, not a place of religious belief, but a place of values. And we make value statements that people actually can, can align with and can actually see as well. And it goes like, it looks like this. I value allowing everybody to live as they authentically choose to live. That is their value as well. And when we talk about values, when we talk about values, and we talk about our community, people turn around. And I'll show you, if you wanna, if you wanna do me a favor and go up to this messaging app, or messaging slide, please. <laughs> I love, I, I so appreciate you. Messaging isn't a triangle, and the way the message, messaging works for most political efforts is you have a problem, you offer a solution, and you connect that problem and that solution through an action. So the problem in this case is, from the perspective of the people making the laws, we have 100 million children around that want to change genders, and they're crazy for doing it, and that's what's happening. And so the solution is to outlaw gender you know, affirming care for children under the age of 18. That takes care of it, right? Everybody's gonna get behind us and do exactly what we want. What they found was that the values that people actually are responding to are the values of authenticity and living as you're intended to live in an authentic manner with all the love and support of your community is having more, a bit more effect in bringing people together than it is in showing the awful, hideous side of uh, transgender and LGBTQ people, which is what they would really like to do. Because ultimately, at the, at the end of the day, the people who are pushing these pieces of legislation are what I tend to call um, conflict entrepreneurs, which is a way of saying, as long as I got you fighting with everybody and I've, and I've identified the fear that is making you move, that fear that's instilling that fight or flight in you, then I'm going to make a buck. Because if I got you scared of something, and I tell you I'm gonna keep you safe, you're gonna write me a check. And that's what is happening. And that's what we found, is that folks in organizations like the Art American Family Association, Arkansas Family Council, all of these organizations, are making me the bad guy so that others will write them checks. And in making me the bad guy so that you can raise money, you're causing our children to attempt to end their life. Four people in the last legislative session, four children attempted to end their life because of the legislation being discussed in the legislature. And you might ask yourself, how do you know that? It's because we had a gender-affirming uh, health care model at work at Arkansas Children's Hospital. But the leaders of the last legislative session walked into the head of the hospital and said, if you don't close this, then we're going to take your Medicaid funding. The fear that they are, they are using is what's driving the whole legislative agenda. Now here's where our progress can come in. That in talking to one another, in talking to one another, we don't say they're horrible people. We don't talk about the people that are doing these things in a fashion that makes them bad. What we do instead is we talk about the actions that they are taking and we talk about why. And we talk about the fear. And then we speak to the value of caring for one another, the collective community value that draws us together as opposed to splits us apart. And so the conversation begins reframing. It's not about protecting children. It's not about the kids. It's about valuing our human existence in a way that respects our own identities. And when we start talking about it and reframing it in that manner with people who are afraid of difference, then the, the communities change. They start opening up and understanding that as, human, as humans, 
our relationship is for one another and should not be such that we're using it to raise money to beat each other up with. Can we go to the next? Yeah. So what does that look like? And here are some actual recommendations, right? So when we talk about shared value, we talk about strong ladies, no matter where we look, what we look like or where we are from, we want to be treated with dignity and respect across our races and backgrounds. We want freedom to be ourselves, whatever our color, background, gender, or zip code. That is a message that can be agreed upon by people across the board without initiating the fight or flight response that we feel when things are changed or things are di different. Do you, does that make sense? I'm seeing questions. What? Oh, I'm just a bit, I'm visualizing having this conversation with any one of my three siblings. We have a monthly sibling Zoom yep. conversation, and I'm just trying to imagine how the, I mean, I agree 100%. You ask a question instead of make a statement. So you ask the question, instead of saying to other people, this is wrong and this is right, you ask the question, why? Why are we targeting transgender children? And the conversation becomes more about the children and less about the danger that they are being put in. And we don't put a judgment on the people who are coming in with these issues. So your your if your brother if your family have if you have family members that fall on the side of I think they're doing the right thing, right? Then you ask a question why why do you think they're doing the right thing to find out what the what what is missing in comprehension about the people that live as transgender people? It'll be because God said so. That's your right. answer. So, so, yes, that's right. And what you, I think at that point what we do is we say, well, God as I believe him is a different God. And, and there are lots of things that we're being told that, haven't, that are not true to begin with. Because, I mean, at the same, using that same logic, there's no football on Sunday. Using that same logic, there's no divorce. Using that same logic, all our first child, our firstborn son should all be dead. I mean, we've got to understand that we have to ask why. Because you, we are centered in understanding this for ourselves and not being told. I have spent the last 30 years telling people why they need to be supporting people instead of asking the very real question of why do you think you should be supporting X, Y, and Z? And getting that conversation going. Because at the end of the day, it's about our values. And it's about our understanding of the other person's values and hearing from that person what drives them, not telling them what they should and should not do. That is the biggest takeaway on this, is that the values conversation, why do you feel that way? If I had said to my mother when I was five, Mom, why do you think I'm a girl instead of a boy? Maybe we wouldn't have lived 40 years in me, 45 years of me saying, what's wrong with me? Right? It would have been more of a conversation of, well, you have all the operating material for a girl. Why do you think you're a boy? And I would not have ignored that, that small child inside of me. And I maybe wouldn't have waited until I was 58 to decide that standing up for myself is standing up for the world and standing up for other people who identify as trans. I'm in Arkansas, folks. I am running for office as an openly non-binary candidate who's mask identified. That means a lot of things. I'm running for Arkansas, I'm running for office in Arkansas, not in not in sweet little Little Rock, but in North Little Rock, Sherwood, Sylvan Hills, and Gibson. And we can do this because it's more important for me to stand up and be my authentic self and talk about these things so that whomever is in, in positions of leadership not only have something that they can look back on that's real, 
and not pretend or, or scary. And other people who are like me can see somebody who's like them doing things that they never thought they'd see themselves doing. I grew up believing that I would never get married. I grew up believing I was less than. I grew up in Jonesboro, Arkansas. I couldn't get away fast enough. And in my, in my 20s, I moved to Seattle. And if you had said to me that when I was 42 years old, I would be back here, and that it was in Arkansas that I would find the love of my life, that it was in Arkansas that I would marry the love of my life, that it was in Arkansas that we would have a daughter who's going to public school and has never had an issue with anyone in the school district. I couldn't have told you that. I wouldn't have told you that. But today, in this world, we can do the things that we need to do. We can do the hard things. And the only reason I know we can do them is because we aren't dead. That's the only reason. Because for the last three years, it's been a struggle, folks. It's been a struggle. And not just from outside forces, but just through the fruition of life. Just the way life runs. Now I spent my early 20s trying to dodge AIDS. I spent my 40s and 50s, or at least my late 50s, dodging COVID. The, main, the time in between those two disasters, I learned how to help other people do the same thing. And that's why I think we can make progress in this state. Because we don't have to sit back and wait for what's next. We can actually make life better for people across the board, whether they like it or not. And we do that just by engaging and having conversations with one another. And over time, as I have seen in other things, this idea of value-centered conversations will catch fire. And you will find that the people that you have in your life are doing the very same thing with the people in their life. And it's going to spread. That's where we make the difference. It's just by standing up and living our authentic life. Now I told, I said on the way over here that I was going to have a problem closing this. I was going to have a problem thinking about how we draw all this in and use it moving forward. And I don't know how I'm going to close this. In fact, I'm not going to close this. I think this is an ongoing thing. There's a conversation that we're, we should have from here on out. And I think this is an ongoing thing that I think we carry with us as we go throughout our days. But just remember that with everything coming at us, with all the more than 200 pieces of legislation, with the fact that we're going to go into a legislative cycle next year, that is going to be centered around these very things we're watching happen across the country. And the question we have to ask ourselves between now and then is, are we ready? Are we ready to deal with the way things are going to be coming at us? And are we prepared within our own self to take care of ourselves and those that we love during what is going to be a tumultuous period? And I think that is still to be seen, and that is with the continuation of the conversation. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to, if there are any conversations, any chats on the, on the Zoom, I'm happy to, I, I, you tell me how you would like to, yes, sir. Uh, so I didn't understand that you talked about negative forces working against this country. Is there any positive forces, either especially within Arkansas or at a national level where you see a there are forces which are helping us. In yeah, so there are a tremendous number, and there are forces that are actually centered within the gay and lesbian community and the, and the women's community, and there are forces centered outside. So the two resources I gave you, Freedom for All Americans and the Equality Federation, are both areas. There are also greater forces, because one of the things that I've seen happen over the course of the last few years is external um, NGA slash uh, 
501c4 organizations cropping up to actually address these issues across the board. A lot of them, there's, a, there's an organization that's called, um, and of course this has happened, I'm like, what? What organization was that? What was that called five seconds ago? Uh, there is an organization centered around gay and lesbian families, Family Equality Network, that is centered around gay and, lesbians, gay and lesbian families to help them. And, I will say this too, and if you haven't heard, there's one other organization that's helping from the external, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and uh, major employers across the country, especially the United States Air Force. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Gina Ortiz Jones is the current administrative uh, head of the United States Air Force. She's not the, the, like the, the statutory head, but she's the administrator. Of the, of the United States Air Force. The United States Air Force came out on Thursday and made a policy statement that said that they will do three things. They're gonna either f help their uh, soldiers and their soldiers' families who are fighting these, this legislation in the states where it's taking place. They will help them legally fight the legislation. And if that is not the resolution that takes place, they will move their soldiers and their soldiers' families to states that actually are supportive of care for transgender children. And uh, they are doing it on their own dime, at their own, with their own policy. This is the Air Force specifically. So uh, do you think that's gonna have any impact in Arkansas? I think it's gonna have some impact in Arkansas. I think that what we don't see is that there are people across the board who are in places of leadership that we did not anticipate being in places of leadership who are making those decisions for us and, and coming up and doing what they think is right. We, don't, we cannot wait for that to happen. We're just lucky in some cases when it does happen. Gina Ortiz Jones, LGBTQ mom of her own, is just not taking it. She's not putting up with it. Yeah, so, so there are organizations like that and there are organizations that are also looking at incorporating this language that we're testing and the language that LPAC and Celinda Lake went through and determined helping us incorporate that into all of our conversations. So they're helping messaging organizations that influence the Democratic National Committee, that influence the friends that we have on, on, in the political arena on how to talk about these issues. So that's the other side is how do we, how do we as politicians talk about it? And what we have found, and this is interesting for folks to know too, is that 45% uh, of the population believes these attacks are, are wrong. And they have found that when politicians and elected officials are attacked for fighting back, that uh, they overwhelmingly support the politicians who are saying no. The, 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 the policy people, the Clark Tuckers, the tippies, the people that are standing up and saying no, the, are getting, are getting um, not just the support, but the hell yeah from people. And we've seen that in the case of the Michigan senator who stood up this week on the floor of the Michigan Senate and said, "You, you know, I had a I told her story of being targeted by a co by a co senator, posting threats." Well, she raised two hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars in one night, one twenty-four hour period, because of that floor speech and because of the viral nature nature of the response. And the people who are responding are saying, "Those are the people that we really want fighting for us." She raised two hundred eighty-five thousand dollars for a state senate seat in Michigan, which is exorbitant amount of money. It's three times more than you would expect to raise in a in a state senate seat in Arkansas. So there is hope. That's my point. My point is, this is an ongoing conversation. It feels really shitty right now. Sorry about the language. It feels really shitty right now, but in the future, it's going to feel better. And it's going to feel better not only for your kids, but for my kids and for our kids' kids, because they will not put up with this stuff. The conversations that I'm, that I'm posting and the videos that I'm showing and all the information that we're getting is that we need the 18 to 24-year-olds to, to actually turn out and take action vote in both May and November, and it's, and it's issues like this. It's issues like equality and fairness 
that are bringing those folks out. And the largest followers that I have engaged on my website, on my social media platforms, are between the ages of 18 and 24, and they're mostly women. So look out for that force, because they ain't, they ain't taking nothing. They're done. They're done with the old white folks like me standing up and telling them what they should be doing. They ain't taking no prisoners. And just, I think that that was pretty, I think that's pretty much what got us where we are today from the last election. And I think we're gonna see it engage, and we're gonna see an engagement level that they know is necessary for the next few. So any, other, any questions, anybody else? No? I wanna thank you for allowing me to come and talk to you. I hope I didn't uh, bore you on tear, in, to tears and in the future, we'll make sure that, we, that I understand exactly what the limitations are and what I can and cannot do in the, in the presentation, okay? Thank you very much. Hopefully I have successfully switched mics. Well, that's it. We hope you found today's meeting thought provoking and we hope to be able to resume, um, you know, having our regular time pretty soon. Uh, if you're glad people in central Arkansas are organizing the secular community and working to improve the lives of free thinkers, please consider joining ASF through arfreethinkers.org. Another way that you can meet new friends and get involved in your community is to attend some of our events. We have a lot of things uh, scheduled on meetup.com. Just look up Arkansas Society of Freethinkers. And there's a whole calendar of events that you can get involved with. If you're spending your life staring at a screen, it's a good alternative, let me just say. Um, upcoming events, we have uh, several of them noted in the program that's uh, there on the table. You can pick them up there if you prefer the print version, but the online option is the way to go. You can download the Meetup app to your phone and keep up with our events. If you'd like to host an event, such as a potluck, a book club, a family's meetup, a picnic, uh, what have you, all you have to do is let us know and uh, we'll get the word out. And that's how you can be a community organizer. It's that easy. It's, you've got to build that community first and we would love to have your help. Also, if you'd like to be considered as a speaker at one of our future meetings or know someone who might be interested in any of the roles that we have, please send us a message at info at arfreethinkers.org. And that, message, that email address is also available at the back table. And uh, we also have uh, a continuing need for people who have skills in graphic design, website design, law, writing, a number of other fields. Probably if you have a talent, it could be applied here at the Arkansas Society of Freethinkers. If you have skills, we'd like to hear from you. Thank you very much for coming, and we will see you next month.